In philosophy, potentiality and actuality are principles of a dichotomy which Aristotle used to analyze motion, causality, ethics, and physiology in his physics, metaphysics, Nicomachean ethics and De Anima. The concept of potentiality, in this context, generally refers to any possibility that a thing can be said to have. Aristotle did not consider all possibilities the same and emphasized the importance of those that become real of their own accord when conditions are right and nothing stops them. Actuality, in contrast to potentiality, is the motion, change or activity that represents an exercise or fulfillment of a possibility. When a possibility becomes real in the fullest sense, these concepts, in modified forms, remained very important into the Middle Ages, influencing the development of medieval theology in several ways. Going further into modern times, while the understanding of nature implied by the dichotomy lost importance, the terminology has found new uses, developing indirectly from the old. This is most obvious in words like energy and dynamic, but also in examples such as the biological concept of an entelechy, potentiality. Potentiality and potency are translations of the ancient Greek word dunamis as it is used by Aristotle as a concept contrasting with actuality. Its Latin translation is potentia, root of the English word potential, and used by some scholars instead of the Greek or English variants. Dunamis is an ordinary Greek word for possibility or capability. Depending on context, it could be translated potency, potential, capacity, ability, power, capability, strength, possibility, force, and is the root of modern English words dynamic, dynamite, and dynamo. In early modern philosophy, English authors like Hobbes and Luck used the English word power as their translation of Latin potentia. In his philosophy, Aristotle distinguished two meanings of the word dunamis. According to his understanding of nature there was both a weak sense of potential, meaning simply that something might chance to happen or not to happen, and a stronger sense to indicate how something could be done well. For example, sometimes we say that those who can merely take a walk or speak without doing it as well as they intended cannot speak or walk. This stronger sense is mainly said of the potentials of living things, although it is also sometimes used for things like musical instruments. Throughout his works, Aristotle clearly distinguishes things that are stable or persistent, with their own strong natural tendency to a specific type of change from things that appear to occur by chance. He treats these as having a different and more real existence. Natures which persist are said by him to be one of the causes of all things, while natures that do not persist might often be slandered as not being at all by one who fixes his thinking sternly upon it as upon a criminal. The potencies which persist in a particular material are one way of describing the nature or itself of that material, an innate source of motion and rest within that material. In terms of Aristotle's theory of four causes, a material's non-accidental potential is the material cause of the things that can come to be from that material, and one part of how we can understand the substance of any separate thing. According to Aristotle, when we refer to the nature of a thing, we are referring to the form, shape or look of a thing, which was already present as a potential, an innate tendency to change, in that material, before it achieved that form. But things show what they are more fully, as a real thing, when they are fully at work. Actuality. Actuality is often used to translate both energia and entelecheia. The two words energia and entelecheia were coined by Aristotle, and he stated that their meanings were intended to converge. In practice, most commentators and translators consider the two words to be interchangeable. They both refer to something being in its own type of action or at work, as all things are when they are real in the fullest sense, and not just potentially real. For example, to be a rock is to strain to be at the center of the universe, and thus to be in motion unless constrained otherwise. Energia Energia is a word based upon rho gamma rho micron nu, meaning work. 
It is the source of the modern word energy, but the term has evolved so much over the course of the history of science that reference to the modern term is not very helpful in understanding the original as used by Aristotle. It is difficult to translate his use of energy into English with consistency. Joe Sachs renders it with the phrase being at work, and says that we might construct the word as at workness from Anglo-Saxon roots to translate energy into English. Aristotle says the word can be made clear by looking at examples rather than trying to find a definition. Two examples of energy in Aristotle's works are pleasure and happiness. Pleasure is an energy of the human body and mind whereas happiness is more simply the energy of a human being a human. Kinesis, translated as movement, motion, or in some contexts change, is also explained by Aristotle as a particular type of energy. -er. See below. Entelechi or entelechia entelechi, in Greek entelecheia, was coined by Aristotle and transliterated in Latin as entelechia, according to Sachs. Aristotle invents the word by combining entels with ekain, while at the same time punning on indelicheia by inserting telus. This is a three-ring circus of a word, at the heart of everything in Aristotle's thinking, including the definition of motion. Sachs therefore proposed a complex neologism of his own, being at work staying the same. Another translation in recent years is being at an end. Entelicheia, as can be seen by its derivation, is a kind of completeness. Whereas, the end and completion of any genuine being is its being at work. The entelechair is a continuous being at work when something is doing its complete work. For this reason, the meanings of the two words converge, and they both depend upon the idea that every thing's thinghood is a kind of work, or in other words a specific way of being in motion. All things that exist now, and not just potentially, are beings at work, and all of them have a tendency towards being at work in a particular way that would be their proper and complete way. Sachs explains the convergence of energy and entelechia as follows, and uses the word actuality to describe the overlap between them. Just as energy extends to entelechia because it is the activity which makes a thing what it is, Entelechia extends to energy because it is the end or perfection which has being only in, through, and during activity. Motion. Aristotle discusses motion in his physics quite differently from modern science. Aristotle's definition of motion is closely connected to his actuality-potentiality distinction. Taken literally, Aristotle defines motion as the actuality of a potentiality as such. What Aristotle meant however is the subject of several different interpretations. A major difficulty comes from the fact that the terms actuality and potentiality, linked in this definition, are normally understood within Aristotle as opposed to each other. On the other hand, the, as such, is important and is explained at length by Aristotle, giving examples of potentiality as such. For example, the motion of building is the energy of the dunamis of the building materials as building materials as opposed to anything else they might become, and this potential in the unbuilt materials is referred to by Aristotle as the buildable. So the motion of building is the actualization of the buildable and not the actualization of a house as such, nor the actualization of any other possibility which the building materials might have had. In an influential 1969 paper I.E. Cosman divided up previous attempts to explain Aristotle's definition into two types, criticized them, and then gave his own third interpretation. While this has not become a consensus, it has been described as having become orthodox. This and similar more recent publications are the basis of the following summary. 1. The process interpretation Cosman and Coop associate this approach with W.D. Ross. Sachs points out that it was also the interpretation of Averroes and Maimonides. This interpretation is, to use the words of Ross that, it is the passage to actuality that is kinesis, as opposed to any potentiality being an actuality. 
The argument of Ross for this interpretation requires him to assert that Aristotle actually used his own word entelechea wrongly, or inconsistently, only within his definition, making it mean actualization, which is in conflict with Aristotle's normal use of words. According to Sachs this explanation also cannot account for the, as such, in Aristotle's definition. 2. The product interpretation Sachs associates this interpretation with St. Thomas of Aquinas and explains that by this explanation, the apparent contradiction between potentiality and actuality in Aristotle's definition of motion is resolved by arguing that in every motion actuality and potentiality are mixed or blended. Motion is therefore the actuality of any potentiality insofar as it is still a potentiality, or in other words, the Thomistic blend of actuality and potentiality has the characteristic that, to the extent that it is actual it is not potential and to the extent that it is potential it is not actual, the hotter the water is. The less is it potentially hot, and the cooler it is, the less is it actually, the more potentially, hot. As with the first interpretation however, Sachs objects that, one implication of this interpretation is that whatever happens to be the case right now is an entelechia, as though something that is intrinsically unstable as the instantaneous position of an arrow in flight deserved to be described by the word that, everywhere else Aristotle reserves for complex or organized states that persist that hold out against internal and external causes that try to destroy them. In a more recent paper on this subject, Kosman associates the view of Aquinas with those of his own critics, David Charles Jonathan Beerer, and Robert Heinemann. 3. The interpretation of Kosman, Coop, Sachs and others Sachs, amongst other authors proposes that the solution to problems interpreting Aristotle's definition must be found in the distinction Aristotle makes between two different types of potentiality, with only one of those corresponding to the potentiality as such appearing in the definition of motion. He writes, the man with sight, but with his eyes closed, differs from the blind man, although neither is seeing. The first man has the capacity to see, which the second man lacks. There are then potentialities as well as actualities in the world. But where the first man opens his eyes, has he lost the capacity to see? Obviously not. While he is seeing, his capacity to see is no longer merely a potentiality, but is a potentiality which has been put to work. The potentiality to see exists sometimes as active or at work, and sometimes as inactive or latent. Coming to motion, Sachs gives the example of a man walking across the room and says that, once he has reached the other side of the room, his potentiality to be there has been actualized in Ross' sense of the term. This is a type of energy. However it is not a motion, and not relevant to the definition of motion. While a man is walking his potentiality to be on the other side of the room is actual just as a potentiality. Or in other words the potential as such is an actuality. The actuality of the potentiality to be on the other side of the room, as just that potentiality, is neither more nor less than the walking across the room. Sachs, in his commentary of Aristotle's Physics Book 3 gives the following results from his understanding of Aristotle's definition of motion. The genus of which motion as a species is being at work staying itself, of which the only other species is thinghood. The being at work staying itself of a potency, as material, is thinghood. The being at work staying the same of a potency as a potency is motion. The importance of actuality in Aristotle's philosophy. The actuality-potentiality distinction in Aristotle is a key element linked to everything in his physics and metaphysics. Aristotle describes potentiality and actuality, or potency and action, as one of several distinctions between things that exist or do not exist. In a sense, a thing that exists potentially does not exist, but the potential does exist. And this type of distinction is expressed for several different types of being within Aristotle's categories of being. 
for example, from Aristotle's Metaphysics 1017a, we speak of an entity being a seeing thing whether it is currently seeing or just able to see. We speak of someone having understanding whether they are using that understanding or not. We speak of corn existing in a field even when it is not yet ripe. People sometimes speak of a figure being already present in a rock which could be sculpted to represent that figure. Within the works of Aristotle the terms energia and entelecheia, often translated as actuality, differ from what is merely actual because they specifically presuppose that all things have a proper kind of activity or work which, if achieved, would be their proper end. Greek for end in this sense is telos, a component word in entelecheia and also teleology. This is an aspect of Aristotle's theory of four causes and specifically of formal cause and final cause. In essence this means that Aristotle did not see things as matter in motion only, but also proposed that all things have their own aims or ends. In other words, for Aristotle there is a distinction between things with a natural cause in the strongest sense, and things that truly happen by accident. He even says that for any possibility to be become real and not just possible, requires reason, and desire or deliberate choice. Because of this style of reasoning, Aristotle is often referred to as having a teleology, and sometimes as having a theory of forms. While actuality is linked by Aristotle to his concept of a formal cause, potentiality on the other hand, is linked by Aristotle to his concept of hylomorphic matter and material cause. The active intellect. The active intellect was a concept Aristotle described that requires an understanding of the actuality-potentiality dichotomy. Aristotle described this in his De Anima and covered similar ground in his Metaphysics. The following is from the De Anima, translated by Josax, with some parenthetic notes about the Greek. The passage tries to explain how the human intellect passes from its original state, in which it does not think, to a subsequent state, in which it is. He inferred that the energia, dunamis distinction must also exist in the soul itself, since in nature one thing is the material, fuel, for each kind, genos, but it is something else that is the causal and productive thing by which all of them are formed as is the case with an art in relation to its material. It is necessary in the soul, such a, to that these distinct aspects be present, the one sort is intellect nous by becoming all things, the other sort by forming all things, in the way an active condition, hexus, light light who makes the colors that are in potency be at work as colors, to foes, poia tardun amianta, cremata energi cremata, this sort of intellect is separate, as well as being without attributes and unmixed, since it is by its thinghood a being at work. For what acts is always distinguished in stature above what is acted upon, as a governing source is above the material it works on. Knowledge, epistem, in its being at work, is the same as the thing it knows, and while knowledge in potency comes first in time in any one knower, in the whole of things it does not take precedence even in time. This does not mean that at one time it thinks but at another time it does not think, but when separated it is just exactly what it is, and this alone is deathless and everlasting, and without this nothing thinks. This has been referred to as one of the most intensely studied sentences in the history of philosophy. In the Metaphysics, Aristotle wrote at more length on a similar subject and is often understood to have equated the active intellect with being the unmoved mover and God. Nevertheless, as Davidson remarks, just what Aristotle meant by potential intellect and active intellect terms, not even explicit in the Dharanima and at best implied, and just how he understood the interaction between them remains moot to this day. Students of the history of philosophy continue to debate Aristotle's intent, particularly the question whether he considered the active intellect to be an aspect of the human soul or an entity existing independently of man.